or you can, I don't know whether you can speak. Uh, I actually love to uh, talk. Uh, but anyway, yeah, anything that you prefer, uh, that is fine with me. So the topics that I'm going to talk about today is statistical relation or extension of answer set programming. Um, this was actually the thing that I worked uh, while I was in the school. Um, and uh, at that time, I was more into the symbolic side and then uh, tried to uh, extend the symbolic uh, uh, logic programming into the way that uh, machine learning can be incorporated or some probabilistic reasoning can be done. Um, and after uh, and and uh, and recently, of course, uh, there's a neural network um, uh, tsunami here uh, that uh, people are actually trying to uh, uh, use um, neural network for the most of this stuff. Uh, in fact, actually, when uh, I'm in currently in uh, industry, and uh, that's actually the whole AI is about in industry. But there are also times a time that uh, the symbolic uh, uh, AI is actually needed. Um, so. Uh, probably I'm going to talk mostly about uh, these answer set programming extensions to uh, some uh, machine learning method, not necessarily tied to the uh, neural network, uh, but at the end of the talk, I'll probably talk about uh, that uh, work too. Okay, so um, the thing here is the statistical relational uh, uh, learning is basically the combination of the two fields. Uh, the statistical is coming from statistical learning, uh, before the uh, deep learning, there was a lot of uh, other uh, statistics-based uh, machine learning techniques, uh, mostly in the probabilistic graphical models. That was actually one of the dominated, uh, dominating topics. Uh, relational uh, reasoning or relational thing is about uh, the logic uh, that uh, rules and uh, symbolic computation was about. So the field of statistical relational uh, learning is to uh, combine uh, these two fields, uh, and because of each of these uh, fields has certain uh, pros and cons uh, that uh, each other didn't have. So that was the idea. And there has been actually a lot of uh, the uh, works along this line, but I happen to be familiar with uh, answer set programming based approach. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. So I just said uh, these things, and actually there are many, many things, uh, and it's like alphabet two uh, um, at that time, like BLP, uh, blog, uh, PRM, MLN, PSF, blog, IBN, IDN, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, here actually, uh, this idea is actually revisited these days also in terms of so-called neuro symbolic AI. Now, um, so the thing that I'm going to talk uh, mostly today is called LPMLN, um, which comes from the two uh, 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 branches. One is uh, of, uh, the answer set programs. Uh, the other is uh, Markov logic network, which is actually one of the most well-known uh, statistical relational learning formalism. But what we noted was uh, there are some uh, cons of the uh, Markov logic uh, networks. So we try to overcome the uh, uh, weakness of that uh, formalism using the idea from answer set programming. And it turns out that uh, this LPM, LPMLN, uh, LP is standing for logic programs and MLN comes from the Markov logic network, is actually related to uh, uh, other uh, uh, statistical relational uh, learning methods uh, such as uh, P-log, uh, prob-log, and uh, false uh, causal model. Um, and this idea turns out to be interesting to uh, find computational method uh, for this uh, new language. All right, so I don't know actually how many of you are familiar with answer set programming. Um, I don't know, maybe it's a good time to call. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I know that some people may not be familiar. <laughs> so you have some slides okay. with it. Yeah, okay, um, th that's good because uh, it doesn't make sense to extend the things that you don't, you guys don't uh, know. So I have some introduction slides for that. Um, so um, it's actually an interesting idea. Um, uh, so it's a declarative uh, programming paradigm and so-called uh, stable model semantics that was invented a long time ago. Uh, and turns out that uh, this is actually one of the uh, branches in the uh, logic-based uh, AI. Uh, people use it for many uh, knowledge-intensive domains and combinatorial research problems. Uh, there's a certain defect of this ASP, which is uh, why 
uh, I got interested in uh, uh, extending it uh, in some uh, probabilistic way. But um, it's, it's still uh, uh, one of the dominant approach in the logic programming community. Um, and it, it is actually, uh, somebody uh, put this equation uh, that you see at the end, ASP is kind of the combination of or uh, coming from this uh, root from uh, logic programs, knowledge representation, uh, constraint solving, especially uh, satisfiability checking, and also deductive uh, databases. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Markov logic um, is uh, an approach to combine first of the logic with the uh, Markov uh, network, which is undirected uh, probabilistic uh, graphical model. And uh, in, in a sense, this um, uh, logic, uh, for, uh, this Markov logic network formalism can be viewed as a set of weighted first order formulas. And technically, you just put the weight in front of the first order uh, formula, uh, standard first order logic formulas. Uh, but then this is actually used as a template to specify Markov network, which is undirected pluralistic uh, uh, graphical model. And uh, it has some uh, ways uh, which I uh, we'll probably explain in terms of ASP later, uh, but you can actually get the probability of the interpretation or model or world um, that is uh, proportional to the exponentiated sum of the formulas that are true in the world. Uh, so basically, more formulas being true, uh, the probability uh, becomes higher uh, and uh, also vice versa. Um, so the idea is the it's a simple idea that tries to turn the uh, uh, rigid uh, first order logic into soft version. And this softness is related to uh, probabilistic interpretation of the uh, model. Okay. All right, so uh, the Markov logic is good for this uncertainty with uh, knowledge base. Uh, the defect here is actually it's based on the classical first order logic. Uh, and because of that, uh, certain limitations are there in terms, in, uh, if you are familiar with the uh, difference between classical logic and the uh, uh, logic programs, um, the first of the logic cannot express uh, certain concepts like inductive definitions and causality and, and aggregate and uh, other things. Um, and uh, on the other hand, ASP is a kind of uh, way to overcome the limitation of first order logic. So people invented many uh, rich uh, knowledge representation constructs, uh, and its rule-based uh, semantics uh, can uh, we can express uh, transient closer or reachability, causality, uh, those concepts that uh, are useful for uh, representing a certain aspect of knowledge. On the other hand, it doesn't actually handle well uh, the probability uncertainty. So uh, that is actually the idea of this uh, LPMLN. Um, so it's a weighted rule. So it's like a Markov logic, but instead of uh, attaching the weight into the first order formulas, uh, we attach the uh, weight in, in the rules, in the logic programs. Um, and uh, it actually follows a similar style of uh, Markov logic network uh, way to uh, define the probability. And one uh, 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 consequence of that is actually it overcomes the deterministic nature of the uh, stable model semantics. And uh, I'm going to explain more details uh, in a moment. It basically, you can have uh, 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 most usual uh, defect of the pure logic based approach. Like uh, if you have inconsistency, how you do you resolve it? If you have some probability or some ranking of the models, for you how do you uh, give a certain preference? Um, and another thing uh, is actually uh, how do you actually apply the machine learning method into the KR formalism? So before ASP has uh, uh, limited uh, expressivity on this side, um, and that's actually where the LPMM comes in. Um, so this is actually kind of analogy that uh, uh, we can say. So maybe, um, so if, if you look at the propositional logic, I don't know whether we can write here, let me try to. Okay, I can use the pointer. So uh, classical uh, propositional logic, specifiability, um, and uh, 
the idea of ASP is trying to uh, extend this into um, some ways that can uh, avoid some defect in the satisfiability. Um, but um, the way that uh, Markov logic works is actually tries to go in from the deterministic nature of the set to probabilistic interpretation. And the LPM LN in a sense is similar to, you can view this as, as a way to extend ASP to a uh, probabilistic way, or you can view this as uh, ML, from MLN to avoid the defect of the classical logic. Okay, so that's actually where the a LPM LN uh, comes in. Okay, so uh, that was actually a rough uh, introduction. Uh, so let's actually talk a bit more about answer set programming in detail. Uh, and this is declarative problem solving method. So here we are focused, uh, we're focusing on uh, what is the problem uh, versus how to solve the problem. So in the declarative, uh, in the traditional programming or this uh, uh, procedural programming, we are given the problem and we turn this into a program, which is called programming. And then we execute this program to get the output and we interpret this output to a solution. And in the declarative programming, we are uh, modeling the problem as a representation. We don't necessarily give an algorithm uh, or uh, some the, the method to solve, but we are actually representing the problem uh, in a way that uh, we can reason. And if you apply some uh, general solving method, you get the output and you can interpret that as a solution. Okay, um, so answer set programming, uh, let me actually skip uh, uh, this slide. There are actually many, many uh, solvers and there's also standard uh, language, but maybe uh, let's actually uh, uh, look at this uh, slide. So uh, the way that answer set programming works is we are going to represent uh, the given uh, problem into uh, so-called answer set programs, which is a declarative uh, rules and use answer set solver to find the solution and then we interpret that output. So the basic idea is uh, consisting of these uh, uh, steps. So uh, writing a rule and then find the answer set and extract solution uh, from this answer set. So let me give you an example, which is Ensign's puzzle. And uh, many people should know uh, this is a typical uh, grid puzzle. No two pins can share the uh, same row, column, or diagonal. And if n equals three, there is actually no solution. If n equals four, there are two solutions. If n equals five, there are 20 solutions. And uh, somehow there's a dipping that if n equals six, there are only four solutions and so on. And after that, actually the number of the solutions actually grow. Now, the way that, uh, this is actually, uh, uh, one representation in answer set programs. And I'm going to revisit this uh, program uh, later with some more introduction to the uh, language. But uh, if you just look at the um, English statement, uh, the English is saying that uh, it's basically uh, uh, describing this problem. So each row has exactly one pin. No two pins are on the same column. No two pins are on the same diagonal. Now, if you represent this concept into some declarative way and you ask uh, some uh, general uh, solver, the solver is supposed to find uh, the solutions to this thing problem. That's actually what uh, the sense of the programming is, is about. Um, so uh, with most of the time, this kind of uh, sentence, you can write uh, as a succinct uh, rules, okay? And, um, well, maybe for now, this does, it could be somewhat uh, cryptic, but uh, we can talk about this in more detail soon. Uh, this is how you call uh, Klingo. Uh, so Klingo is actually one of the uh, answer set solvers. It's probably most popular. Um, so uh, you so given the description of the problem that uh, you have here, so this is the input to the Klingo program. And Klingo is sense of the solver. We, uh, we specify the input, uh, pins.lp, and then dash c uh, is actually to declare the constant. Uh, so n equals eight. Uh, there was actually uh, n here, which was not specified, uh, which uh, didn't have the specified uh, value, but you can actually instantiate with uh, this command line. 
Okay, so n equals eight, then it will uh, find the solution. And um, you can actually put uh, zero at the end, and then you will get actually uh, all 92 solutions. And you can generate all these solutions in a quick amount of time. Okay, so that's uh, uh, as I said, programming. Uh, okay, so um, so let me actually talk a bit more about this uh, so-called stable model uh, semantics. Um, so here I'm uh, going to use uh, some form of the rule that is a bit more general than uh, the typical rule form. I'm going to allow some uh, nested uh, junctions and disjunctions. I'm going and because that actually does not affect any complexity. Um, so I'm going to treat uh, the formulas as a rule. Uh, the one only one thing that I'm going to uh, uh, say is. Uh, Actually, first, uh, I'm going to write f if g, uh, which is actually the same as uh, g implies f. This is just a syntactic uh, uh, variation. Um, the formulas or the rules uh, that I'm going to uh, use is f if g. And here, f and g are implication free, which means that all the other connectives, uh, bottom, top, uh, negation, conjunction, disjunction, can be nested arbitrary way. Uh, but uh, the implication is only appearing only one time. Okay, that's the only one limit uh, uh, restriction that I give. Okay, so uh, some notational thing. So f if top, I will, I can simply write f. Okay, so top is actually absolute truth, right? So true, false kind of thing. Now, so <laughs> I don't know whether. Uh, I, I promise to ask some questions, but um, feel free to answer on the chat. Is this a propositional rule? Is, the, is this the rule that I defined? Maybe somebody can write on the chat. People can also just uh, talk directly. Yeah, yeah, feel free to talk. They, they, yeah, they, they, they should be able to unmute the, the, the microphone. Yeah, it, it's not a big uh, audience, so I think you guys can un unmute and, and can talk. Yeah, just by the way, we wait uh, people to, to say something. Hopefully, <laughs> let me remind you, uh, uh, you that we should have a 30 minute uh, break at some point. Uh, whenever you you think it is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, so uh, let me, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pano. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what about this one? No, right. It is, uh, the first one is fine uh, because um, the first one has uh, F if G form. And if F and G has uh, no implication inside, that's fine. So this one has implication here, so it's not, okay. Uh, what about this? It's a bit tricky, but it is, yes, because it's, it's actually belonging to this case. So F if top, okay? So you can think about this as if top here, we can just uh, drop this part, okay? It's not terribly important, uh, but uh, just to uh, have some quick idea about what the rule that I'm going to use. Uh, in a moment, um, the generality of this syntax uh, becomes handy, okay? Um, okay, so propositional program is just a set of these rules. Okay, fine. Another thing. Um, uh, so here we are going to first uh, talk in terms of propositional uh, logic uh, case that uh, we are going to talk about interpretation, interpretation or truth uh, assignment. Uh, so if we have P and Q, uh, you can have four assignments of truth value. You can, uh, that's, that's also called interpretation, okay? Now, uh, what we are going to do is a convention that uh, we are going to identify the interpretation with the set of atoms that are true. Um, so, for instance, uh, if you have uh, the uh, uh, signature P and Q, you can use P and Q 
uh, then uh, there are actually four uh, interpretations uh, possible. Uh, let me actually, if I can write here. So uh, when both P and Q are false, I'm going to denote it as a set, which is empty set, because uh, none of them are true. Uh, if P is true and Q is false, then I'm going to write it as uh, P, singleton set P. If Q is true, P is false, then I'm going to write this. If both of them are true, then I'm going to write this. So uh, this is the way that um, it, uh, comes handy uh, to talk about interpretation in, in terms of sets of atoms. Okay. So for signature that are P and Q, that this formula uh, P or Q has three models. And those three are this one, this one, and this one. Because uh, this one is not because it uh, means P and Q are both false. So you cannot satisfy this P or Q. Okay. All right, um, so before we go into the stable model semantics, uh, I want to introduce minimal model uh, semantics. Uh, it's a bit tricky to uh, distinguish between minimal models and stable models. So before we go into the stable models, let's talk about the minimal models. So the minimal model simply means that once we turn the uh, interpretation into a set of atoms, we can understand the minimality in terms of the uh, set inclusion, which means that uh, we say that uh, uh, I is a minimal model if there is no other uh, model of F that is a subset of I. Uh, so for instance, uh, here, uh, the same example that you saw, Q or Q has uh, three models, okay? Now, what are the minimal models? These are models, but uh, I'm asking you now, what is the minimal model? So the minimal models are actually this one and this one. Okay, this is not because this one has P as a subset, uh, and this also, uh, you can say Q as a subset of uh, this PQ. So this is not a minimal model, uh, but these two are the minimal models. So there can be actually more than one uh, minimal model. And uh, obviously uh, some practice here that um, find all uh, minimal models, uh, then, oh, hi, Bertram. I didn't know you were here. <laughs> okay. Um, so this Steve Q, uh, Q or R, um, you have R as, uh, you can check that R is a, a minimal model and also uh, P and Q are minimal model. So there are actually two minimal models here. All right. Um, so uh, this is a statement that you can easily prove. Uh, if uh, two formulas are equivalent, then they have the same minimal models. Okay. Uh, how about this? If uh, is the converse true? If uh, two formulas having the same minimal models, are they uh, equivalent? Do they have same models? Having the same minimal model doesn't imp does it imply that uh, the two formulas have same models? And of course, it's not true because uh, there are many examples you can come up with, uh, but let me actually give one case, which is just easy to uh, okay, I think about. So, um, so here, um, these two formulas have the same minimal models, uh, which is P and Q, okay? So obviously these are the minimal models P or Q, and also these are minimal models of this, but uh, they have different models because this guy, this guy, actually this guy has another model, which is PQ. So they are not equivalent, okay? So that's just some practice, okay? Now, um, so going back to these uh, rule form, uh, if you have this idea of minimal models, you can understand minimal models as um, uh, sets of, um, atoms that you can generate by applying the rules. So if you have rules like P and R if Q, uh, P, R if, uh, P and Q, then you can think about the SSF program or the, uh, this uh, logic programming rules as a way to generate sets of beliefs. And here you want to uh, believe uh, minimal information. You don't want to believe more than necessary. So if you have uh, these two rules, uh, this is probably, uh, this is just short end for P, P is top. Uh, the first rule says you have to believe P no matter what, okay? So this body is always true, so uh, you have to believe P. Uh, but then if you look at the second one, 
The second one says, if you believe P and Q, then you have to believe R. But right now, I have to believe P, but what about Q? I don't have to believe Q. So that means, um, since I don't have to believe Q, I don't have to believe P and Q is true, so I don't have to believe R is true. So if you, uh, so this is the way that you can apply the informal semantics um, to, and in terms of belief. So what is the uh, uh, minimal belief that I can derive from this? Uh, using that intuition, you can say that um, P is the uh, belief that you can have. It's a rational belief, okay? And it happens to be the same as minimal models. If you just compute the minimal models of these two rules, okay, the conjunction of these two rules, then you will see that uh, this is the uh, so, uh, minimal model of the program, okay? So that interpretation is nice uh, that uh, the, the, view, the view that uh, you're going to have for the program. So this program is uh, supposed to generate the set of beliefs. Um, mathematically, it simply means that uh, it's a minimal model. You just look at the minimal model. Okay. So um, yeah, this is actually basically what I uh, just said. So let me skip that. The problem is actually uh, it becomes a bit uh, weird uh, when you have when you start to have negation. So uh, for those who may have seen uh, or who played with Prolog, um, this is a very simple pro, uh, Prolog rules that you can type in, and then Prolog will give error because it cannot terminate unless you use some uh, method like tabling. Uh, Prolog will say uh, this is out of a uh, local stack. Uh, on the other hand, if you turn this into uh, the language uh, into Klingo, I mean, basically you can give the same uh, input to Klingo, then uh, you will actually uh, get two answer sets. One is the uh, singleton set P, another is singleton set Q. Uh, by the way, uh, in the language of AST, uh, some, uh, we use as, is NOT, um, but basically I'm going to equate it as uh, simple, uh, the uh, uh, indication in propositional logic. Okay. Now, one uh, key difference between uh, Prolog and ASP, uh, Prolog may not terminate, but ASP is always guaranteed to terminate, as long as it's a finite ASP program. All right, um, so before I talk about uh, the uh, semantics of this negation as failure, let me mention about this rational uh, belief. So try to uh, think about what is actually the, mini, uh, the rational belief uh, that we can generate uh, from the program. Okay. Uh, so let's actually look at the first rule uh, here. Uh, and this is actually easy. Um, so we have to believe P and we have to believe Q. And if I, have, if I believe P, then I have to believe R. If I believe Q, I have to believe S. So the minimal belief that you can generate from this is actually a set of all atoms here. Okay, I can derive all of them. Um, now, what about the uh, next one? Okay, so here I have to believe P, good. If I, I have to believe Q, and if I believe Q, then I have to believe S. Okay, so my belief uh, should contain P, Q, and S. But how about this third rule that I didn't use? Well, if I know S is true, then this is actually false. If this is false, then uh, we don't have to believe R, okay? Because we don't, we are not forced to believe R. R is to be in the belief only when uh, you believe the body is true, okay? But that's not the case here because we already know S is true. S is, so here, this is false, so this is false, so that we don't need to derive R. So this is the minimum belief, okay? Now, what if I drop the, uh, drop the last one? Then I have uh, P, Q, same as before, I have to believe it. But now, S is not uh, believed. So there's no way that you can use this program to generate S. Hence, S is assumed to be false. If S is assumed to be false, negation of S is assumed to be true. And if it is true, then P and true, we already know P is true and this is true. So then we have to derive R. So this becomes my rational belief, okay? So here, uh, I, I started to give some informal uh, semantics in the way that um, it's kind of circular. So you will actually notice uh, uh, carefully if you listen to this, there's something weird about this. There's no way that you can derive S 
from this, I can actually say that lattice is false. Okay, but how can you do that um, sometimes? That's actually uh, something tricky that I'm going to show you uh, in a moment. But anyway, for this one, um, I mean, it, the easy thing to check is S does not appear anywhere in the head of the rule. Okay, so S can ne never be true. So I can safely say that this is this this S is false. So then uh, this becomes true. Okay, now what about the last one? In the last one, P is supposed to be true, but same logic as before. There's no reason to uh, believe Q. Okay, and if Q is not believed true, uh, then S can never be true. Okay, if S is never be true, again, in the same uh, logic, this is now true. So P and this true makes R to be true. So this becomes a rational belief. Okay, so uh, I, I guess this might be a bit confusing to some people who see uh, this first. In fact, that is actually normal because if you look at the semantics of logic programs, uh, uh, there's been a lot of uh, ideas about how to define this meaning of negation in logic programs. If uh, negation is called negation as failure. Um, and stable model semantics is actually one of the uh, ways to respond to that uh, challenge. Um, like the, so let me actually uh, say this. Um, so the informal uh, principle that I was following here is, uh, of course, the belief should uh, should satisfy the rule. Okay, and that what that means is, if if you want belief uh, in the body of the rule, then one must also believe uh, is had. And uh, but there is another uh, principle here that uh, this rationality principle, meaning that uh, believe nothing if you are not forced to believe. So you will only believe your uh, uh, the things that you are forced to believe. That's the uh, rationality uh, principle. Okay. By the way, these are just uh, informal uh, description. I didn't actually give any uh, semantics of uh, these things. Um, maybe let me skip uh, this example. So uh, from this, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, real semantics. Okay, so um, so there are actually uh, a few steps here, uh, or a few definitions that I'm going to need. So one is actually so-called critical part of the uh, propositional rule, and what that means is um, it should be the maximal sub formula that starts with negation. That's what is called a uh, critical uh, part of the rule. Um, so it, it maybe it's better to uh, give an example. So, um, so let's actually look at uh, this rule. And the critical part of the rule, um, I mean, I can actually uh, go uh, very slow here. Uh, so tell me if it is too slow. Uh, I can write the uh, parse tree, okay? So, which is uh, P uh, not an S, okay? And the uh, uh, critical part is actually the uh, part that has uh, negation in the root, which is not under the other uh, such uh, uh, subtree. So this is the maximal part that starts with negation. So this is actually the critical part, okay? Uh, what about this? This one has, Three negation. So, what is the critical part? Okay, so you can have negation, P, uh, negation, uh, sorry, implication, negation, P, and then a negation, and then uh, conjunction, Q, negation, R. Okay, so there are actually two uh, such uh, critical parts, which are these. Okay, so I can also. If you're familiar, then I can just write uh, this as the critical part. If you have this one, obviously this is the critical part. And if you have this one, this is the critical part. The reason that I'm actually uh, giving uh, this definition is because uh, the stable model semantics will uh, change this critical part into true or false, okay? So uh, what I'm going to do is only changing the critical part 
if it is uh, true under the current interpretation, I'm going to replace this, this top, okay? And if not, we are going to replace this bottom. And so let's actually uh, look at the uh, example. So this is the program that uh, I showed you earlier with uh, informal semantics. And what I'm, so actually there, um, what I'm going to do is, um, if I explain this uh, definition, I'm going to form the critical part. So if I have uh, P, Q, R, if uh, P and R, not there, okay, so what I'm going to do is, this is my interpretation. So P, Q, S, let's just look at the, uh, this interpretation and then uh, uh, try to convert uh, this program into another program where the critical part is replaced by top and bottom. Now, the only thing that we need to change is this one. So let me just copy the other part. Okay. So I have to now change this part. I cannot leave the negation, okay? Now this negation S and, and uh, applying this interpretation, this interpretation means that S is true. So negation S is false. Okay, so then what I'm going to do is replace it with bottom. So this is what I'm going to do. Now let's actually play with another one. Again, um, the critical part is the same. So I'm going to copy all the rest of the part. Now this one has S is false. So S is not in this uh, set, meaning that S is false. If S is false, then negation of S is true. I'm going to replace it with top, okay? All right, so, I mean, you can get the idea. So let me just uh, write this one too. This is similar to previous one, okay? So each interpretation, uh, uh, first you fix the interpretation and then you can apply this um, uh, transformation to the critical part. So. These formulas are all similar to each other, except that uh, whether this is bottom or top, depending on whether this uh, uh, interpretation makes this critical part to be true or false. That's all the thing uh, it's about. And then finally, now voila, this is the stable model. So stable model is the minimum, it's actually it's a stable model. If X is a minimal model of the reduct. So this is called the reduct, this transformation is called the reduct. Uh, that we just obtained by replacing the critical part with top or bottom. Okay, so let's uh, check uh, these things. So uh, PQS, so this interpretation is now X here, is X a stable model. So the step is we have to construct this reduct and uh, this is the reduct that we obtained. And then we have to check what is the minimal model of this. So the minimal model here means P and Q, and this is actually false, so you don't have to derive R. So P, Q, S is actually the minimal model. You can check it. And this minimal model happened to be the same as the one that you started with. So that actually satisfies this definition. So we can say that P, Q, S is a stable model. Okay, so if you are seeing this first time, it's a is it, it requires a lot, uh, uh, some computation. Uh, I'm, I'm going to actually summarize this in a moment. Uh, but basically the step is first uh, guess what is this uh, uh, X, okay? To check what, whether this X is a stable model, you construct this uh, reduct, uh, this transformation, and then uh, check what is the minimal model of this. And if it happens to be the same as the original one that you guessed, then this is a stable model. Um, now, this one, PQ, uh, you will see that uh, the minimal model of this program is actually PQ, and since P is true, R is true, and S is true. So minimal model of this is PQRS, which is not the same as this one. So this is this PQ is not the stable model. Okay. Um, and similarly, you can actually check uh, this is not a stable model. Let me actually not go into each of them. You can check uh, if you're interested in. Okay. 
Um, so this is the step. Um, so given a propositional program uh, to find the stable model, okay, you guess an interpretation and then find the reduct and then check if X is a minimal model of the reduct. Okay. The key thing here is when you convert it into pi X, there's actually no negation left. Okay, so that, that is the key uh, 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 thing here. All right, um, I guess, uh, I mean, one good thing is actually you don't have to worry about computing stable models uh, by uh, uh, yourself because uh, this will be automated by SSS over, but it's actually a good idea to uh, know this. And this is quite uh, theoretic, uh, so maybe I'm not going to go into that uh, details. Um, the good thing is there is actually the easy um, thing that you can um, uh, get the intuition. So you don't have to, so basically when you write answer the program in a moment, you don't really need to go through this of, uh, computation yourself. There's a programming idiom that you can uh, uh, get. Um, so I'm going to actually give some intuition uh, in a moment. Um, so. One thing that I'm going to talk about here is actually, um, this is not the same as the uh, classical uh, equivalence. And so, yeah, I don't know whether I, uh, whether I have to uh, talk about this. So maybe, let me actually, Yeah, let me actually skip uh, this one. It's basically the models uh, and the same models are actually different. Um, but this is actually some quiz maybe uh, you can think about. Uh, so when I define this stable model semantics, the definition was saying that uh, X is a stable model of pi if X is the minimal model of this reduct. Now, Often thing that uh, uh, people get confused, um, and I'm alluding already answer here, but <laughs> so X is a stable model if X is the minimal model of pi. Okay, so these two sentences have uh, a slight difference. Only difference here is actually whether we're checking the minimal model of the uh, redux or uh, is a minimal model of the original program. Okay. Now, uh, is this um, uh, definition uh, equivalent? Obviously, this is actually not. So uh, maybe what, what could be the good example that we can try? So here's actually something interesting. Uh, let me ask you, uh, P or not P? Okay, what is the minimal model of this program? minimal model. So what is the minimal belief to make this to be true? So the answer is actually easy, uh, empty set. You don't have to believe anything, meaning that P is false or any, uh, any atom is false, okay? Because this is a tautology, okay? So P or not P is always true. And this is the minimal model. Now, what about the stable model? So in order to check the stable model, we have to form the reduct. So let's actually check, I uh, guess, with, uh, what, what about this empty set? Is X uh, minimum uh, stable model? In order to do that, um, this, let's say this is my pi. So pi X, which is pi empty set, I'm going to replace not P, which is the top of bottom. So this is the critical part. Should I? change the top or bottom. So this means that P is false. So not P is actually true. So this becomes top, which is actually equivalent to top. Okay, again, it's a tautology. The minimal model of tautology is actually empty set, which is same as this one. So we can conclude that this is a stable model. Empty set is a stable model. Good, that, that makes sense. Now, what about x equals p? Okay, if you take uh, reduct, 
this becomes P or it's actually opposite now. This is system. And this is actually equivalent to P. And what is the minimal model of the fact P? That's this P, which is same as this one. So this is also a stable model. So uh, what do I get here? I actually have two stable models for this program. Uh, singleton set uh, P as well as empty set. Okay, but if I take the minimal model, there's only empty set. This is the minimal model. Okay, so this program, this uh, simple rule, is saying that uh, these minimal models are not the same as stable models. Okay, and this rule is actually quite interesting. Uh, this, this looks like a tautology, and it is indeed a tautology. But um, a stable model uh, can be very useful. So as I just show you, uh, stable model, so this is uh, empty set and P. Now, if you have stable models of this, um, you can actually check there are actually four stable models. And in fact, uh, in general, if you have uh, uh, this uh, general thing, that is basically all the uh, uh, subsets of this uh, P1 through Pn are the answer uh, stable models of this rule. Okay. So what that means is uh, it basically generate all possibilities, all uh, possible uh, world can be generated by this uh, uh, simple program. And this is called choice rules. So if you look at the uh, rules like this, you can eat, uh, immediately find that uh, the stable models are all the possible subsets. And in the Klingo, uh, this is the way that you can type in. Um, so uh, I can type PA, P of A and Q of B, there are two atoms here. Uh, and if you give uh, Klingo this program and uh, put uh, zero at the end, it'll generate four answer set or four stable models. Okay, so by the way, answer set and stable models are synonym. So you can just take it uh, uh, the same uh, term. Uh, so here is an empty set, and then the single concept and the uh, two element set. Um, so this is a kind of uh, programming uh, thing that you can write uh, the interval, uh, which will be expanded into uh, this way. Or you can, if you have pooling, this is called pooling, you can, uh, the Klingo will understand it as this. Okay. So there will be eight uh, answer sets because uh, this is the all possible subsets of this P1, P2, P3. Same here that there are eight answer sets or stable models here. Um, well, and you can actually give the bound on this. So not only all the subsets, but you can actually give the bound. So that means actually you have to select at least one element from this P1, P2, P3, but at most uh, two from P1, P2, P3. So if you give this uh, thing, this gives the cardinality bound so that you will get actually six uh, stable models. All right, um, and there is actually the variables that you can use, which becomes handy. Um, so when you have uh, this uh, x equals one, two, uh, this will be instantiated. Okay, so p one, q one. Uh, there will be another case when x equals two. So this will be p two, q two. And this one uh, will means basically it means that you have to select uh, exactly one element from this set. So you will get either P1 or uh, Q1. In the same way, either you get P2 or Q2. So there are actually four combinations possible, which is shown here. All right, um, some other programming thing. Um, so sometimes you can actually write this uh, thing into uh, inside this uh, set brace. And in this case, I is so-called local uh, variable, okay? So the definition of local variable means that uh, this I is only within uh, this set brace, then it's called local. 
And if you have an uh, I also appearing in the out outside this set race, then this I will be classified as global variable. So uh, I, show, I show you actually the global variable here. This X is actually global variable because this X appears, of course, inside this set uh, race, but it also uh, appears outside. So this is global variable. The way that the global variable works is, is generating multiple rules, okay, uh, as I show you here. In the case of local variable, it doesn't actually generate uh, more rules, but it actually expands inside. So here we, uh, I goes from one to seven, then um, it's actually uh, generate this huge uh, list of uh, atoms, okay? Now, again, this is all choice rules, meaning that you can select P1 or not, or P2 or not, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this will give all the choices uh, uh, coming from this uh, seven element. So how many stable models will be if you give uh, this into the clean row? Can you guess? A, B, C, D, you can, you can choose one. So it's actually uh, each of them is a choice. So you can either choose to include P1 or not, P2 or not, P3 or not, and so on and so forth. So they're actually 128 to 2007 possibilities. So this is a simple one rule program which has uh, this many stable models. Um, if you have the uh, global uh, uh, variables, this will be actually expanding uh, into this way. Uh, and, and this will generate multiple rules. But again, this rule means that uh, to include P1 or not, P2 or not, P3 or not. So if you apply the uh, lingo, you will also get 128 uh, stable models. What's in, what becomes interesting is actually when you uh, start to uh, use both local variable and the global variable together. So this is one, uh, one rule, uh, but um, this I is actually global variable. So let me actually write this. So the way that we understand it is first I will be replaced with the instance. So the first rule will be this one. And then the second rule will be uh, when I equals two. So this is two comma J and J equals data C. Okay, this is uh, when I eliminate uh, global variable i. But the next thing is we can actually further eliminate uh, j. So this rule will be turned into 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3. It's the same. 2, 1, 2, 2, 2 3. Okay. So that's actually what is uh, being shown here. And the stable model here, how many stable models will be there? There are actually eight stable models here, two to the power of, uh, three and two to the power of three. So eight times eight, 64. Okay. Um, all right, um, so that's actually one uh, part. Another uh, programming idiom uh, that is useful is a constraint. And the constraint is a rule that has no head, um, or actually when uh, the head is empty, it simply means that the head is uh, bottom. And the rule is read as a constraint, meaning that if P1 is true, then the false is false. So that means P1 uh, should not be true, okay? So um, here is an example. If you have P, uh, this rule only, you will get uh, uh, eight uh, stable models. So P1, P2, P3. Okay, so P1, P2, P3, and they will generate all these eight uh, uh, stable models, depending on the choice. Uh, but when I add this uh, P1, so basically if P1 is true, then that cannot be the stable model. So among these things, uh, when, when P1 is true, these are actually eliminated uh, from the stable model. 
Okay, and the remaining are the stable models of these two rules. Okay. Uh, similarly, if you have uh, this one, you have uh, eight possibilities coming from the first rule. And the second one you're saying actually is kind of double negation. So bottom if not P1, meaning that P1 must be true. And in this case, uh, the stable models are the one that has P1 in it. So these are the uh, stable models. Okay, and the others are not stable model. Okay, so basically you generate uh, some possibilities and then you can prune it uh, using these choice rules. Okay. And here, um, uh, this is all eight possibilities. And uh, if P1 is not there and P2 is not there, uh, then uh, it is not a stable model. So meaning that this cannot be the stable model. Okay, all others have at least P1 or P2 in, so they become the stable model. All right. Um, okay, so now let's actually come to this uh, twins puzzle that I promised. Um, so, so you basically understand. Oh yeah, I I, I, I introduce all the uh, constructs to understand this program now. And uh, the way that uh, you can organize a program is so-called generate, uh, define, and test. Um, so just generate part is usually to generate search space uh, using, uh, typically using some choice uh, rules. Uh, and sometimes you want to define uh, the new atoms in terms of other atoms. And the test part is usually in the form of constraint. You can eliminate uh, those uh, stable models that violate the constraint. So having that in mind, uh, so let's come back to uh, this one. Okay, so the first one is, uh, uh, okay, so the first rule has this form, okay? Uh, so R goes from one to N, and for each R, the queen uh, can be at R comma one or R comma two or R comma N position. Okay, so basically this uh, rule describes that each row has exactly one queen. Given the rows, there should be exactly one queen uh, in the column position that should be matching. Um, so if we uh, expand this, and this one actually has both um, uh, global variables and actually this uh, local instantiation. So for the global variable, let's say that R, R n equals three for now. If n equals three, then uh, this rule will be like this. So r becomes one, two, three, okay? And then this one will be further expanded. So one comma one, one comma two, one comma three, and so on. So what that means is, uh, if you look at the queen's position, one comma one, one comma two, one comma three position, you have to choose uh, exactly one uh, queen, uh, one position uh, from this uh, set. So you can place the queen in one comma one or one comma two, one comma three, but you have to choose exactly one. Same for the second row. Okay, so two comma one, two comma two, two comma three, the second row, you have to select exactly one queen. And also uh, the third row. So what that, what that means is basically you have to choose exactly one, uh, for each row, you have to choose exactly one color. So that was actually the first rule is about. Now, obviously this will generate the, uh, such uh, space which contains the solution, but more than that. So the remaining thing to be done is to eliminate uh, those things. So one, one thing that we want to eliminate is uh, what if uh, those uh, pins are on the same column? Okay, so we, we only, uh, the first rule was only checking about each row should have exactly one pin, uh, but it didn't uh, uh, do the, uh, checking for the column. So you can just write one rule here. So if you have queen and R1, C and R2, C, so C is the same, that means uh, these R1 and R2 are on the same column, okay, then this violates the constraint, meaning that you cannot put the queens on the uh, same column. Uh, the other one is about the diagonal condition, which is also like this. So if these absolute values are the same, then that means these two pins are on the same uh, uh, diagonal. So that should be the population. And this is the whole program. 
to uh, write uh, to solve uh, Enkin's problem. And in fact, actually, many of the uh, problems uh, can be written succinctly this way. Uh, and I show you actually this one before how to uh, find solutions okay, using uh, the uh, Pringle. Okay. All right. Um, I guess uh, I will probably uh, go to section four and then maybe we can take a break after that. Um, so having uh, mastered all these stable model semantics, the remaining part is actually uh, a bit easier. Um, so, uh, so having that stable model semantics in mind, we are going to define a probabilistic ex uh, uh, extension. I told you this one before, so let me actually go straight to here. Um, so this is a simple knowledge base. Uh, the first knowledge base is saying that uh, X is a bird if X is a resident bird, uh, and also X is a bird if X is a, mi a migratory bird. And X cannot be both resident and migratory bird at the same time. This is the uh, constraint, okay? But there's also another uh, knowledge source that uh, the particular bird uh, called Joe is a resident bird. Uh, uh, there's also another knowledge source that uh, Joe is a migratory bird. And obviously you notice that if you combine these together, this is unsatisfiable, okay? Because this Joe is violating this constraint. Right? Hence, you don't get any stable model or no answer set. Uh, so they can entail anything. Uh, so contradiction is actually um i mean it's a problem right it's uh an inconsistency and then you can derive anything uh there's a problem now in lpm at end uh this uh, case can be avoided by assigning the weight uh, even when we uh, write infinite weight or the absolute um, uh, weight uh, we can still resolve this inconsistency, which is actually an interesting uh, uh, feature. Uh, but you can also write uh, weight uh, into the rules. And the idea is uh, a stable model basically doesn't have to satisfy all rules. And uh, obviously, if the more rules are true, then more likely uh, that the stable models will be. Okay, and maybe let me get to the uh, syntax. Uh, okay, so syntax is now simple. You already know what is the ASP rule. Uh, the syntax of uh, LPMLN is basically just appending uh, this uh, W. And here W can be a real number or some special symbol alpha that denotes infinite weight. Okay. And okay. Um... All right, so uh, in order to define uh, soft stable models, uh, I'm going to uh, define this pi uh, subscript i, which means it's a subset of the uh, rules that are true. Okay, so given the interpretation i, we are only uh, looking at uh, the true rules. And i is called a stable model, if I is a, uh, a standard uh, stable model of this sub program. Okay, so what, so here the main point is, uh, as I said, uh, if there are some rules that are not true, uh, I'll forget about that. Okay, and I'm going to select only rules that are true. And then from there, I will derive the stable model. Okay, that's what I call a soft stable model. And um, the weight of the stable model is obtained by this equation. So there are two cases that this i that I started with is a soft stable model of pi. Uh, also equivalently saying that i is a stable model of the pi subscript i. Then I'm going to uh, add up all the weight of those two rules and then make exponentiated sum. Otherwise, uh, this will be zero, okay? So I will probably, uh, the example will probably uh, give you a better uh, idea, but let's actually just have a first look at uh, the semantics. It's basically, you look at the true rules and you aggregate this uh, uh, 
uh, w, the weight of the rules, and then you make exponentiation. And then uh, normalized weight is actually the probability. You actually apply uh, this over the whole normalization. Uh, so uh, let's look at the example. Um, here, these are all alpha for the simple for simplicity. Okay. Okay. So according to this, this is a bit uh, of uh, <laughs> uh, things to do, but uh, let me let's let's actually uh, pick uh, some of the uh, things. Um, so, for instance, let's take the empty set. Okay, so empty set means that you're not believing anything. Um, if that's the case, then what are the rules that are true here? The rules that are true are uh, this one, because uh, this is actually this false implied false, which is true. So this is true, and same for this one. Okay, and same for this one. Okay. This is false because uh, to make this true, I have to uh, believe uh, resident for this uh, Joe is true, which is not in my belief. Same for this one. So if you apply this interpretation, you will see that R1, R2, R3 is true. And because of their sum of the weight is 3 alpha, I will get the weight of e to the power of 3 alpha. Okay. And same way, uh, you can get uh, the uh, rest of the things. And then you can uh, build an equation. Uh, you can build this table, okay? And uh, note here that uh, this is, um, actually, I think I mentioned, this alpha is actually going to the infinity, meaning that if you uh, have the normalization, basically all the other weights uh, will be uh, disappear when you do the normalization, the probability becomes zero. The only thing that uh, will remain is actually these uh, three uh, models. So each of them will have one uh, third of the thing. And before actually going into the details, if you just look at this, uh, it makes sense. So this is the stable model, first the stable model with the probability one third. Why? Um, the one, so this means that uh, Joe is uh, resident of Earth, and Joe is also BERT. The rules that are being true is uh, R1, R2, R3, and R4. Uh, it doesn't satisfy the last one because that's not in this belief. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, this is symmetric. And even similarly, uh, these all atoms that are true actually doesn't satisfy the third rule, but all the other four rules. So what happens here is uh, like this. So for instance, here, for this one, the last one, if you forget about this, the knowledge base becomes consistent, okay? And for this one, if you forget about R5, knowledge base is consistent. And if you have uh, this one, Okay, same way. If you forget about only this one, then the knowledge base is consistent. So basically what it tries to do is to uh, minimize uh, the uh, uh, number of uh, rules that are false. And from the remaining rules, if you can restore the consistency, uh, then you can call this as a stable model. Okay. Um, okay, so actually, um, there is a, a lot of computation to do, so let me just skip that. Um, now I can tell you actually, uh, if you have a uh, different weight, then uh, this is the equation that uh, you can actually generate this table. And from this, uh, you can compute all the probability uh, reasoning that um, what is the probability that uh, Joe is a resident bird or uh, Joe is migratory bird and so on. So. Uh, so this kind of uh, probability, probability computation uh, can come from this. Okay. And yeah, so this is actually the uh, summarization of the uh, weight and the probability. Uh, well, something actually interesting here is um, you can actually define uh, the semantics uh, in a different way. 
So this is called the reward based semantics. You basically you look at the rules that are true, and uh, from those true rules, you obtain the weight. And then you add up and then uh, make an exponentiation. The other way is actually you can go opposite. You can actually look at the all rules that are false, and then uh, you uh, aggregate them with the uh, negative sign. You can do it either this way uh, and then normalize. You get exactly the same probability as the first definition. The reason that this is actually interesting uh, uh, later is sometimes uh, this formulation actually gives uh, 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 better uh, computational uh, property when you use uh, answer set so far. Okay. All right. Uh, so let me uh, skip that. Okay, I think uh, this is a good time to have a 30 minute break. Perfect. Uh, we we take we we'll resume so, so in 30 minutes. Okay. Resume. Actually, I decided to drop the uh, section five uh, relating uh, LTM and other languages uh, and directly go into the inference and the learning. Uh, uh, I can share the slide so you can, you can take a look at uh, that section. I think uh, the rest of the thing could be more interesting. Um, so uh, one thing, uh, so now that we have defined what is the semantics of this language, we want to compute. Actually, there are two uh, important things, uh, we want to compute uh, the uh, models and their probabilities. So that's what I call inference. And uh, there's also the weight. Uh, where is the weight uh, coming from? We have to, uh, we could learn the weight from the data. Uh, that's the learning in LTMLN. Uh, that's actually called parameter learning. Uh, there's another thing called structural learning, which is to learn the rules itself. Uh, but uh, that I don't have the results. And, uh, that's actually another uh, complex uh, 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 idea that can be uh, tried. Uh, and there are the results in the other statistical relation of learning formalism, uh, but not in LPMLN. I presume that it can be easily in, uh, uh, migrated. I don't know. Maybe no, I cannot say easily, but uh, there is a way to uh, do that, but I haven't worked on that. Okay, so, um, and then maybe I will probably more talk about the uh, more recent work along this line, which is the embraced neural network. Okay, so um, before I talk about inference, um, I want to talk about another construct in the language of Klingo uh, called weak constraint. And uh, the weak constraint has this simple form uh, that uh, has uh, this colon, uh, uh, um, iPhone or the, the tilde, uh, which is not the same as the uh, one that you saw before. The one before you saw was just the hyphen. This was the constraint, uh, but this is weak constraint with the tilde, and it has this uh, weight uh, at uh, level. And uh, these two are the numbers, and basically uh, the level is kind of the level that you want to set, and each uh, level uh, you are actually assigning the penalty if uh, F uh, becomes true, okay? And this is kind of uh, the way that uh, Klingo uh, uh, people made uh, in order to have optimal uh, uh, stable model. They wanted to assign the uh, kind of weight into the stable model and to uh, select more optimal model than the others, okay? Um, so, um, here uh, you can think about uh, the program pi consisting of two parts. One is the usual ASP program, and pi two is a set of uh, weak constraints. And stable model here will be just the stable model of the uh, usual ASP program. Uh, but using the pi two, which is a set of weak constraints, we want to uh, order uh, the stable model. Uh, so, and to do that, we need to define the notion of penalty, and um, here, the penalty is actually the uh, sum of the uh, weight uh, that makes this uh, F to be true. So here's a simple example, uh, P and Q. And uh, for, this, for this P and Q, uh, there are two stable models. Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. There are actually four stable models, okay? Empty set, uh, singleton set uh, P or singleton set Q, and then uh, PQ. 
Now, uh, th there are four stable models, and here we want to uh, give the penalty. And this rule, we're saying at level zero, uh, the penalty, if T is true, uh, that stable model will get the penalty 10. And uh, this rule is saying at level one, if Q is true in the stable model, then the death stable model will get uh, penalty five. So for instance, if we take the uh, single sunset P, one of the stable models uh, here, um, at penalty uh, at level zero, uh, it will get the penalty 10 because of this one. So P, this uh, stable model satisfies this uh, uh, weak constraint so that the penalty at 10 uh, I mean, a penalty at level zero will be 10 here, but it doesn't have the penalty at uh, level one. Okay, so the penalty at level one is uh, zero. Okay. All right. And there is a notion of the uh, dominant uh, stable model. And uh, basically they want, so uh, before reading this detail, uh, what it means is actually the uh, each level actually uh, you, you look at the highest level first and then uh, uh, you want to say that uh, whether this uh, there is a penalty uh, that is higher okay or lower okay so that uh, uh, first check the highest level and uh, if there's a tie then you go to the uh, uh, lower le uh, le uh, 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 level and so on and so forth but now it's the same uh, level uh, same level if you see another uh, stable model that has less penalty, then uh, the original stable model is actually dominated. Okay, so if uh, the stable model is not dominated, that is actually the optimal stable model. Okay, so basically at each level, you want to uh, minimize uh, the penalty. Okay, that, uh, I mean, you want to get the stable model that uh, gets the minimal penalty at each level. And the higher level uh, is more important. So let me actually, I, I will actually go into, uh, go through the example to uh, give a better idea. Uh, but uh, the, one of the main thing that I wanted to use here is I'm going to use the weak constraint uh, to turn the language of LPML into ASP. So for the inference, I'm not going to design uh, the new uh, solver for LPML. I'm actually going to Use the reduction to ASP uh, to uh, compute LPMLN. Okay, so here is actually the uh, weak constraint uh, that you saw uh, before. And if you apply the uh, Klingo, um, Klingo, so Klingo test, uh, and uh, it will actually give only one stable model. And the stable model here is actually the empty set. Um, and that makes sense uh, because Empty set uh, will not get any penalty because empty set does not satisfy P, that does not satisfy Q. So actually penalty uh, for the empty set at level zero and level one is actually both zero. So that's the uh, uh, optimal stable model. If you have at least one of them to be true, then they will get the penalty. So uh, they will not be optimal, they are not the optimal stable model. Uh, I can actually type in this uh, command uh, dash dash optimal mode enum. Uh, to enumerate all the stable model, even if um, it's not, op I mean, to display all the non-optimal models as well. And here then you will see uh, for the empty set, this is actually empty here, so uh, the, uh, you get actually uh, zero, zero as the uh, penalty. And this is the Q, and Q get the penalty five at level one. Uh, so this is actually level one. So this is level one, uh, penalty five level uh, zero, not to zero. Uh, for P is opposite, okay? And for P and Q, it gets the penalty for both uh, uh, levels. So if you look at the, uh, uh, the ones, according to the uh, description, you first look at the uh, level uh, one, uh, which is here. And from this, uh, you want to get the minimal one, which is actually either this one or uh, this one. But then you go to the next level here, this is level zero, and this is actually smaller than this one. So this is actually optimum, okay? So easy way to think about, you go to the highest level, get the uh, smaller, smallest penalty one, and if there's a tie, you go to the uh, lower one, and you go to the next uh, smaller one, okay? So uh, 
the uh, optimal stable model will be the one that gets the less, uh, least penalty uh, when you go through the levels in this order. Okay, so um, how can we now turn the um, LPMRN into ASP? Um, so the trick that I'm going to use is to introduce the new atom uh, called onset. Okay, so remember, in the soft rule, I can give uh, some real number uh, uh, as a weight. Okay, and this rule can be either true or false. If this rule is true, then uh, the stable model will get the uh, weight of uh, this one. If it is false, it doesn't get uh, the weight of this rule. Okay. The way that we use, uh, uh, we do the translation is uh, write this one. If body is true and the head is false, then the onset atom is true. Okay. So this defines the new atom onset based on if body is true and head is false, then onset I uh, becomes true. And instead of this rule, I'm now going to append this not onset. Okay, so what that means is uh, you have to believe head if you believe body, but also it's not the case that you believe onset. Okay, so you think about this as a double negation, not, not, set. That means actually, if this rule is satisfied, then you have to believe head is body. Okay. So what that means is actually this onset can be true. In that case, this rule will not fire. Okay. If onset is false, then this rule will fire. All right. Um, and when onset is actually true, then it gets the uh, uh, weight or this penalty as a weight at level zero. Uh, for the hard rules, it's similar, uh, but hard rules are actually more important. So it actually gets to level one, and uh, this, it actually counts as one as the penalty. But the other part of the translation is the same. And what the theorem is saying, uh, that most probable stable models of the LKMNM program are precisely the optimal stable models of this translation. Okay, so uh, uh, the stable uh, stable models of this LPMNN program are roughly exactly as the stable models of uh, this one, the optimal stable models of this one. So this is actually the idea of the translation. Um, so let's actually. Uh, think about uh, this example. Okay, so what is actually the uh, most uh, probable stable model here? Okay, so empty set here does not satisfy P, so we don't get this weight. Uh, and empty set satisfy uh, this one. Okay, so the weight is actually uh, e to the power of 10. Uh, So e to the power of 10, we get this uh, weight, okay? Now for the p, um, so if p is true, then it gets the uh, weight here. Uh, but p is true, but q is false here, but we don't get this one. And for this one, we get actually minus 20. So the weight is e to the power of uh, alpha, uh, actually, p, so it is actually e to the power of alpha, right? Because p is true and q is false. So this one doesn't fire and this one doesn't fire. So it is actually e to the power of alpha. And in the case of q, um, this one is false, but this one is true. So we get e to the power of 10, okay, and minus 20. And if both P and Q are true, then this one is true, this one is true, this one is true. So we are we actually get e to the power of alpha plus 10 minus 20. So which one gets the highest weight? It's actually the P that gets the e to the power of alpha. But this is actually the most probable stable model. Uh, in fact, if you apply uh, this translation, um, so 
you actually get uh, this stable model together with the auxiliary atoms, and P is actually the op optimal stable model. Okay. So that's the, that's the translation. Now I talked about all, uh, only the optimal stable model, um, but uh, in fact you can actually enumerate uh, the probability too. So basically you go to the uh, stable models, uh, you you look at the onset uh, atoms, okay, and from this onset atoms uh, you can actually collect uh, the weight. And you put the uh, uh, negative, uh, you put the uh, minus. And this is actually penalty-based weight that I introduced earlier. Uh, this is equivalent to the reward-based uh, way. Uh, but basically, you go to the rules that has onset atoms, and if you collect all this uh, uh, weight, you can actually get the probability. Okay. And uh, so this is actually what you can compute uh, using uh, some um, uh, uh, program uh, to go through the rule uh, with the weight. Okay. So, so let me ask you a question, uh, mm -hmm, so just sure. to be sure that I'm getting this. So you can obtain all the models with their stable models with their probabilities by using weak constraints. Is that correct? Uh, so yeah, we we can uh, enumerate all the rules uh, that are uh, true or false. So onset means it's actually false. The rule is false, and so you go to that uh, uh, rules weight uh, that you recorded. And that you you just aggregate those uh, weights, so that way you can actually compute the probability. Okay, so um, so this is actually the pipeline. Um, and again, I mean uh, this uh, uh, manual calculation is always uh, difficult, um, but um, uh, you can actually play with the tool. Uh, so here we have the GitHub link uh, for the LTMN system. Um, so here you have uh, uh, input as LTMN and program, you compile it into ASP uh, with weak constraint, and then you use Klingo, which uh, compute uh, stable models. And um, you can actually have these modules that aggregate over the onset, uh, unsatisfied rules uh, weight, um, and uh, that's, uh, 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 that's the module that you uh, put, so that you can compute the properties of the stable models, or you can compute uh, marginal and conditional probability of uh, the uh, proposition. Uh, or if you bypass this, you just go to the uh, optimal stable model. That's actually the most probable stable model of the original LTMN program. Um, note here that actually computing this probability is actually hard uh, because uh, basically you have to enumerate all uh, stable models in the worst case. Uh, actually, it, it, for, to compute the probability, you have to normalize. And the normalizing means that you have to compute all stable models and get, uh, get their probability or get their weight and then normalize it. Uh, that's actually costly uh, 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 computation. Um, so uh, to avoid that, there is actually a sampling idea. So you get enough uh, samples of the stable models and from this sample, you can compute uh, the probability. All right, um, so uh, I can, I will show you some examples. Um, so I had the manual computation before, uh, but this is the uh, computation that we can do with the uh, uh, LPMLN for, this is inference mode of LPMLN. Um, so here you have the same program that you saw before, and um, the command line interface is just, you write uh, LPMLN infer and then write this, uh, and then, uh, uh, gives the program name, then you can uh, get this uh, 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 answer set. Um, so you can actually ignore the onset. And the way that Klingo works is it tries to find the optimal stable model. If the first one that is fine, it may not be the optimal stable model, but it will go through until it finds the uh, optimal stable model. And then at that point, it will say optimum found. So you only need to look at the last one. This is the most probable uh, stable model. Uh, and here, the probable stable, mo probable stable mo most probable stable model says that Joe is the bird and Joe is the resident bird. And what that means is actually you forget about the last one, uh, but uh, uh, this uh, 
uh, most probable stable model satisfy all these four rules. Okay. All right. Um, you can actually enumerate all uh, 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 stable models. Sometimes it's uh, handy because maybe you want to debug or you want to find out uh, uh, the probability distribution. So then you can actually uh, get actually three stable models of this LPMM program with their uh, probability. So again, uh, this one was actually the most probable one um, and followed by uh, this one. And uh, this is the last one. And you can also do the uh, uh, query uh, atom. So it's a marginalization of the query. So I'm not going to be interested in the uh, stable models, but I'm going to be interested in the uh, some of the probabilities uh, that uh, of the stable model that satisfy this proposition. So uh, you can say what well, uh, uh, find the probability margin, marginal probability of uh, residence for its true is true, then it will. Uh, get this one. And uh, I told you that there are actually two modes here. Uh, one is to use exact computation, which is costly, but uh, the computation gives exact numbers. Uh, and there's a sampling based uh, uh, method, uh, which is called MCASP. Um, and if you do that, you get a faster computation uh, uh, using the sample. Okay, so the numbers could be a bit different from the exact computation, but it, it, it could be faster. Uh, if we want to do conditional probability, so uh, he, uh, we, uh, 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 the system support uh, giving this argument of evidence file. Uh, so here, uh, the, the question is, um, what is the probability of a uh, uh, resident uh, bird uh, once we know that uh, uh, this uh, bird, uh, this Joe is a bird. So this is kind of dub uh, this double negation, which means that we already know that Joe is a bird. And what is the chance that Joe is a resident bird? And the chance is uh, like uh, 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 73%. Um, you can also uh, do the debugging, yeah, meaning that in AST, uh, oftentimes you do the um, uh, you find that there is no stable model, but you don't know well, what's, what's the problem. Um, but uh, uh, interestingly, it's a side effect uh, that we didn't actually anticipate, but it turns out to be quite handy. Uh, this input is exactly the same ASP program. All these rules are hard rules, and in LPMLN hard rules, we don't actually uh, write uh, the alpha explicitly. Okay, So the hard rules are the same as the usual ASP rules. But then when you write ASP, uh, I mean, when you give uh, this into the input to LPMLN and to find all uh, rules, uh, all uh, um, this is uh, find all stable models uh, with the probability. And this is um, uh, the command, uh, the option that we, we translate uh, hard rules. If we do that, um, although the original program is unsatisfiable, uh, LPMLN will actually find the uh, uh, stable model. There are actually three stable models. And if you look at the onset atom, uh, they're actually, um, uh, each of them has one onset atom, meaning that uh, this could be a stable model if uh, four is uh, four is unsatisfied. If so, what that means is if you forget about fourth rule, then you can check that uh, uh, bird jaw and migratory uh, bird jaw is a stable model of the rest of the rules. Uh, similarly, uh, it's basically onset atom here means that um, you can forget about some part of the uh, rules and, and uh, you can restore the consistency. And obviously, uh, it will try to find the uh, uh, minimal uh, uh, the, the rules that are minimally violating uh, the, uh, uh, each other. So basically, uh, it, it could be handy if you want to debug uh, what, what rules are conflicting with each other. You can run it, you can check the onset atom. Okay, so uh, having this, uh, you can do many, many um, 
uh, probabilistic reasoning. One thing is um, you can do the Bayesian network uh, uh, represent, uh, representation. Uh, so for those who remember what is uh, Bayesian network, it's a graphical model, right? directed graphical model. And you have uh, the node uh, that is associated with the uh, probability, uh, probability table. Um, so here's a very, uh, this is a representative uh, textbook example about the base network, uh, meaning that uh, if somebody tempers, uh, then uh, alarm may be ring, or if there's a fire, then uh, fire will cause alarm, or fire will cause uh, smoking. If alarm is on, then people leave. If uh, some, uh, people leave, then somebody will report. And uh, this is easy to represent as a rule, but uh, the important thing is also there's a probability associated with each node. Okay, so for this one, the probability of tempering is 0 0.02. Uh, for this one, uh, the joint distribution will say that uh, if the uh, uh, parents node has a certain uh, combination, what is the probability of this alarm will be true? And same for uh, each of them. And this is actually- Can I ask you a, ask a question? So, uh, so you will have to translate somehow to represent this probability as uh, uh, weights uh, for rules or? Yeah, we can we can do that in the LPM and later. I mean, th this this slide itself is just a uh, standard uh, Bayesian network. Okay. And what I'm going to say is, of course, uh, we can present this in LPM and use the tools in LPM Thank you. Yeah. So I mean, the the the, the representation is actually straightforward. Um, so. Uh, the first part is to represent this uh, probability uh, associated with each node. Um, so, um, so for instance, here, uh, probability of tempering equals true is 0 0.02. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually writing this uh, probability fact atom. So probability fact of uh, uh, this to be uh, true is uh, log of uh, 0 0.02 over uh, 0, uh, 0.98. So this is how to uh, represent this. Um, and I, I will tell you actually how, why this makes sense. But the way the the way that uh, this works is um, given this. So this is probability fact for the fire to be true. Uh, you turn this into log of p over one minus p. Okay. So that's how you translate. Uh, for this table, there are four uh, uh, rows. So each of the four rows will have uh, this one. Again, uh, log of uh, p over one over uh, p over one minus p. That's how you represent the probability. Okay. So it's, it's actually a, a modular uh, translation that we can do. If I uh, I mean, I can explain why uh, this uh, makes sense. Uh, when this is actually true, um, then uh, this rule will get this probability. So e to the power of log of uh, this one. And if we normalize it with uh, the case when this is true, then we get this weight. And if it is false, we don't get anything. So we get e to the power of zero. And then if you just uh, compute this again, then the probability of this uh, being true is p. And similarly, you can actually compute the probability of this being false is one minus p. So this is just a compact way to represent uh, uh, this, I mean, the translation uh, of the probability into weight. And, and, and then if you apply the LPM arithmetic, you get the, uh, the uh, original uh, probability. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, uh, the other thing about the Bayesian network is you have to represent uh, the deck, right? These uh, edges. And these edges are basically um, the uh, standard ASP rules that you can write. Um, one thing to note here is actually we can attach, uh, attach this uh, probability fact. So when this fact is true with the uh, parent node being true, then alarm will fire. Okay. Again, this is uh, straightforward uh, to represent. Once we do that, um, and this is actually the real input to uh, LPMLN, 
we can do all the uh, reasoning about the Bayesian network. So uh, the probability of fire being true, given alarm is true and tempering is false, um, we can encode uh, the, um, uh, the condition as the evidence, and then uh, we can call it. Okay. And so basically diagnostic inference um, so you know the consequence that uh, leaving is true. What well, is the call? Uh, uh, whether uh, was it firing? Uh, you can actually ask that uh, curly, and you can check that if uh, leaving is true, then there's a 35 chance that fire is true. Well, of course, the other reason is actually somebody may have tempered the alarm. That could be another reason. So uh, that's why uh, 35 chance for now. Uh, and predictive query is if you know if you have fire, then how what's the chance that people will leave? Uh, you can get it, um, and and all all this kind of uh, mixed inference, okay, and intercausal inference too. This is uh, what's interesting about the base network. Um, if you know that alarm is true, um, that you know that tempering is true, then there's a less chance uh, for the fire is true. Because that kind of uh, this fact explain away uh, that why alarm is true. But if you know that alarm is true but tempering is false, then uh, fire becomes true uh, definitely or more, almost definitely. Okay, so this intercausal relation, which is uh, uh, the uh, uh, well known example in Bayesian network, uh, you can uh, check uh, with uh, LPMLM tool. All right, and, and uh, the other things are, of course, all the uh, graph uh, problems. AST is actually good at many graph problems. Uh, and then uh, we can also associate with the probability uh, related to the graph. So typical graph problems could be, um, you. Uh, so given that there's a path between the two nodes, what is uh, most likely graph? You can actually construct graph uh, based on the uh, known uh, path relation, or um, you can uh, have given to node what is the probability that there exists a path between them. Okay, so this kind of thing. And obviously here, of course, we don't know whether the edge is absolutely there or not. So we know that 30% chance uh, there's an edge between zero and one, or 20% chance that uh, there's an edge between one and two. Okay. Uh, you can make the um, so uh, uh, so. I mean, for instance, uh, here we have the uh, typical uh, transitive closer uh, for the path relation, and then you can turn it into probabilistic traveling salesman problem. So we know that certain edges are not. Or we don't know whether uh, certain uh, certain edges are not. Be sure there. But what is the probability that uh, there will be a Hamiltonian uh, circuit? Okay. So all the standard graph problems that are already uh, solved in ASP, ASP is already applied to many uh, of these NP class problems, you can further turn them into the probabilistic version. Um, here is another uh, example. Um, and uh, this is actually about the node. Uh, so it's more like the communication network kind of thing. Uh, there's a node, uh, which is the kind of communication center, and it can fail uh, in there's an edge. Um, and uh, if X and Y are connected, if there's an edge, and if these two uh, uh, centers are not uh, failing, okay? And uh, kind of thing. And then you can ask questions about what is the probability that uh, these nodes are connected, okay? So, I mean, I, I won't go through this uh, computation, uh, but uh, you can aggregate all these paths and then uh, give, get the probability. And in fact, you can actually just compute using the LKML tool. Um, another example that is actually well known in statistical relation and learning literature is um, this kind of uh, social network example or uh, here is actually a virus, virus example uh, this was an example actually before the COVID-19 uh, so uh, the, the idea is uh, x has a uh, x carries a virus then uh, x has a disease 
But this is not a certain knowledge because somebody has a virus doesn't necessarily mean that he has a disease. Uh, he may be immune for some reason. Uh, and also if X and uh, X contact Y and X carries virus, then Y carries virus. Again, this is not a certain knowledge. Okay, so we can actually associate some numbers like 1.1. Okay, sometimes even if uh, these people contact, uh, but uh, it may not, uh, the person may not carry the virus. And, and then you, you have all the relation that who contacted uh, whom and uh, who has the virus, and you have this kind of network. And then you can reason about what is the chance that this person gets a virus. Um, and uh, this is actually, uh, you can do. Uh, the reason that this is actually, uh, interesting is if you apply uh, Markov logic then you will not uh, get the meaningful results because uh, here we are talking about the reachability and in Markov logic you cannot represent reachability and actually not the and the transitive closer cannot be represented so even if there's no edge um, in Markov logic um, you will get uh, some influence that B and E are kind of connected okay so, all right, um, and then uh, let me actually just go briefly about the learning. I don't uh, have too many slides on this, uh, but the main motivation here is I put the numbers 1.5, 1.1 before, but I mean, where do we get this number? Of obviously, we don't actually want to give a uh, human uh, written number here. Um, the typical setting here is uh, we get we give the uh, uh, parameters. Um, and these are to be uh, learnable. And uh, the data is about the uh, observation. So we know that uh, these people, uh, whether they carry the virus or not carry the virus and that has disease um, uh, or not. So we, we have this uh, kind of database. And then uh, what we try to do is uh, the find the way that explains the uh, database in the best way. Or another way, so find the, uh, 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 the uh, weight that actually explains the data in the best possible way. And um, actually, this is what I uh, said uh, just before Markov logic. Uh, for this example, will be uh, very weird. Um, so it will actually uh, say, uh, these things. Uh, so even if uh, uh, A is the only one who carries the virus, um, somehow he affects E, F, G, which are not connected. Okay, that's that's the defect of Markov logic network. Um, but the main uh, uh, what I wanted to say here is actually how do we get the weight? And um, the the uh, the tool that we are using is actually the standard uh, gradient uh, uh, distance, or maybe here gradient ascent is uh, uh, more intuitive because we want to maximize the probability. Okay, so for, the, for those who are familiar with machine learning uh, terms, uh, maximum likelihood estimate is basically trying to find the weight um, that uh, uh, explains uh, this in the max, uh, best possible way. Um, and all we need to do is to find this gradient. And it turns out, um, actually, yeah, actually this is the whole thing. Um, so we want to uh, maximize the probability of the database, okay? And if you uh, compute the gradient, okay, uh, the gradient will be of this form, okay? So it's basically, uh, the difference between the two numbers. One is the number of rules that are false under the database versus the expectation of the number of false ground instances of the rule I. Okay, I, I guess maybe this is probably hard to explain without the example, um, but uh, what I wanted to say is um, here, uh, you can actually update the weight uh, using the standard gradient ascent way, and the gradient was actually uh, defined. Uh, you can actually uh, derive this equation uh, based on the uh, uh, definition of probability of the uh, stable model. Okay. 
The only problem is actually there is a one uh, uh, side that uh, you have to compute the expected value of the number of false instances, meaning that you have to go over all the stable models and what is the expected number of the false uh, uh, rules. Okay, how many rules will be false uh, uh, in there? If we have only one stable model, you can just compute. You just go over the rules that are false and you get the uh, number of uh, false rules. But uh, expected number, you have to actually go through all stable models, and that's intractable. Uh, and the way that uh, this can be remedied is actually using the uh, sampling method. I was actually alluding to this uh, before. Um, and basically, this is to generate the stable models uh, as a sample. And if you select enough uh, stable models, uh, you can actually compute the expected value from uh, those samples. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, one question. Yeah. One question. That maybe it's very quick. So you mentioned actually that before the sampling, and you are using Klingo. So that means Klingo gives that functionality for you, or oh, you yeah. have to add so something. This is actually external to uh, Klingo. So uh, what we do here is. Actually, we are uh, using Klingo in the pipeline in the middle. So here, uh, this is actually external to Klingo. We, we start with some uh, arbitrary uh, stable model or any stable uh, model in the beginning. And from this, we look at the rules that are not true in that stable model. This is how uh, we can actually enumerate them. Uh, and then we add uh, each rule with this probability and get uh, some some uh, kind of uh, intermediate program. And then we use Klingo uh, to uh, find the stable model. So each of the sampling, we are going to use Klingo, but before we use Klingo, we have to uh, uh, remove uh, or add some rules. Okay, so that way we are interleaving the use of the Klingo here. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, okay, good question. So we are using Klingo, but not entirely just uh, relying on it. We just add or delete some input. Okay. All right. So the uh, for the remaining uh, time, uh, let me go over uh, this one, which is more recent than uh, the LTMLN. Um, so one idea here is actually the um, so basically a, a neural network comes in, and um, can we actually embrace the power of neural network? Uh, this is also good uh, statistical uh, learning method. Okay, and then we have uh, we have uh, these probabilistic answers the program or LTMLN. Uh, so this is what uh, Luke the rest group uh, was advocating. Um, so uh, he they uh, they actually said that um, if you want to combine uh, this neural network, uh, it's better to do through the probability. So uh, they were advocating uh, combining logic probability and neural network together. Uh, one criteria that uh, they were suggesting, uh, or on, I, I, actually I should say actually there are many, many uh, integration idea of the neural network and the logic. Um, but one thing that uh, they said was unlike the others, if we want to integrate two frameworks, A and B, then you should have A and B as a special case of the integrated one. And many other uh, formalisms were not in that way, either uh, compiling the logic into the neural network or maybe uh, uh, the other way around. So that uh, this kind of uh, special case was not reserved. Uh, and another uh, thing that he uh, that they said was actually, uh, you have to use the probability, not, not only just logic in that, but you have to integrate with probability. So deep problem is their invention. And uh, there are other uh, uh, work uh, like Neuras is uh, something that we did. And there are also other things like uh, uh, neural log. Uh, so let me actually explain, given this uh, idea about the probability and system programming, uh, it turns out that uh, the deep problem idea is quite nice. We can easily uh, attach the uh, neural network. So this is the um, uh, simple program. Um, so here 
uh, this is the choice rule, meaning uh, it's, it's written slightly different form than I used before. But basically, uh, this one means that uh, digit D1 could be 0, or D1 could be 1, or D1 could be 2, to D1 could be 9. So this gives actually uh, 10 uh, possibilities for the digit D1, same for the digit D2. And once you know that uh, the, uh, the first digit is this and second digit is this, uh, then their sum is just adding these two, okay? So this is just the uh, uh, ASP program, uh, and you can check that there are actually 100 uh, stable models. And uh, obviously, uh, each of them is just all uh, a combination, right? So 0, 0, 0, 1, all the way up to uh, 100. Now, uh, adding the probability is easy. Um, so this is uh, annotated uh, probability here. So that um, this is not the standard uh, ASP, but we can annotate uh, the uh, weight here or the probability here. And if you want to compute the probability of the addition uh, uh, D1, D2, uh, 3, and there are actually four cases. Uh, the first number could be 0, second could be 3, or 1 and 2, or 2 and 1, and 3 and 0. And you can add, add this, okay? So the probability is actually coming from these uh, choices and you just uh, need to uh, add them up. Okay, so why this uh, is related to the neural network? Because neural network can give the probability. So the like the MNIST uh, digit classifier actually gives uh, the probability of uh, this to be uh, uh, the numbers, right? So what is the probability of this to be two or this probability? I mean, so actually the, it will give uh, the 10 probability, the probability of this digit to be zero, one, two, all the way up to <clears throat> nine. <clears throat> the same for this thing, okay? So if you have the probabilistic SSI program um, and if you just get the probability from the neural network, uh, then yeah, this is the pipeline. And uh, this is some more technical uh, details. Um, there are some cases that uh, you may have more than one stable model and you have to normalize, uh, but let me uh, skip this for now. Okay, um, so what could we do? So one easy thing is you want to solve Sudoku. And uh, obviously uh, we can write it's actually uh, similar to the n -Queens problem that I showed you before. <clears throat> so I'm not going to go through each of the rules, but uh, basically uh, this is the whole uh, program that you can uh, solve Sudoku in ASP. Uh, but the interface is you need to get the um, probability. So here now we are changing this problem to be the uh, visual Sudoku. The input is the handwritten uh, digit of the Sudoku board, um, and you want to solve this. One easy way is actually you can <clears throat> use the pre-trained neural network to identify the uh, digit, and then you can predict, uh, uh, you can actually compute the solution. So this is not the most ideal way, but easy way to uh, use uh, both neural network and ASP. Yeah, you use the neural network to uh, give the probability distribution about the, each of the digits, and then you just feed it into the ASP. Okay. It's not a magic, it's, it's just a simple thing to do. Uh, the interesting thing here is um, sometimes uh, people in the uh, neural network community is trying to do everything only in uh, neural network, uh, and they actually, that's not their fault, but most likely the young students don't try to learn anything else than the neural network. Um, the easy way to solve this kind of problem is uh, here, you can use a, a convolutional neural network that can classify the digit, uh, but you can associate with the ASP and then you can solve this. <clears throat> the other way that I'm showing you here is um, uh, Park uh, uh, used convolutional neural network to <coughs> solve uh, Sudoku. Then, uh, he was not using the visual Sudoku. He was giving, uh, he was actually 
uh, giving the ASCII representation of the Sudoku board. And he had to use 1 million training example, and the accuracy was uh, 70%. Now, the standard method these days is actually the graph neural network. Uh, so, called uh, here is actually the <coughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> in the graph neural network uh, <clears throat> you can uh, <clears throat> use many training uh, example and you can achieve actually very high accuracy but still it takes a long time for uh, training and this one doesn't actually use uh, visual Sudoku as input. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so uh, the other one is actually um, if you want to, if you are changing the problem, uh, so this is actually offset Sudoku. And here, uh, instead of the, uh, so uh, in addition to the basic uh, requirement, <clears throat> you, uh, there are colors. And you have to place one through nine uh, in the same, <clears throat> in the same uh, colors. <clears throat> and to do that, uh, you have, in the neural network, uh, if you have to do this, you have to train all things from the beginning. But if you have the separation of the uh, digit recognition <coughs> and the solving, you only need to just add one rule for the uh, representing the offset to Kuku. <clears throat> now, uh, this is actually not terribly uh, interesting in the sense that mm, you can actually uh, uh, use any uh, pre-trained neural network and then uh, use any uh, kind of um, uh, logic programs or any other symbolic program. But what's interesting is actually you can use this logic program to train the neural network better. Okay. <clears throat> so here is the idea. Uh, the problem is you are given the two digits, but you don't have the labels for each digit. What you know is these two numbers add up to some uh, label. So the label here is just the sum of the two digits. And from this, can you uh, uh, make, can you uh, learn the classifier for each of the digits? <coughs> so this is called weak supervision because the label is not per the uh, image, but it's after some logical operation. And this is what the uh, neural network is actually not good at. It actually uh, does well if you have the direct supervision that if it's image two, then it will try to learn it. But if you go through this pipeline of these uh, logical uh, uh, steps, then um, this is actually hard to do. Um, but the way that we do here is uh, uh, we can actually use the uh, the AST <clears throat> and we can um, uh, make the loss function to go through so that it can actually train the neural network through this uh, supervision. Okay. So in this case, uh, the learning is to find the weight of the neural network that maximizes the probability of the observation. And if you look at the um, gradient here, gradient of uh, this uh, 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 output with respect to the theta, you can actually, uh, so the theta is actually neural network parameter. There is actually no parameter here, but the neural network has the parameter. How do you adjust the neural network so that you can maximize the uh, label probability? You can actually, uh, <clears throat> You can actually uh, divide this into two parts. <clears throat> One is the um, is a back propagation. What is the probability of the addition given uh, this probability distribution? 
multiply by how this probability is affected by this uh, theta. So using the chain rule, <clears throat> you can get this uh, gradient. So the point is um, this one, uh, you can actually uh, use uh, the uh, logic program uh, semantics. <clears throat> uh, this is a bit more complicated uh, proposition, uh, but yeah, it makes uh, some sense. So for instance, <clears throat> suppose uh, you have the neural network with this uh, probability. So uh, the probability of uh, P uh, with uh, uh, this um, digit uh, is maybe one, or another probability that digit is actually two, okay? So the case, so you, you want to maximize the uh, observation uh, and uh, to do that, you will actually find the gradient of P. So suppose um, we know that <clears throat> the model satisfies uh, C equals B, but currently uh, that uh, P is small, then you want to actually uh, increase uh, the current of probability. And that increase is bigger if P is currently smaller. Okay, and similarly, you can uh, get the other case too. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> so here is actually the example that um, we can use this idea. Uh, so here, uh, this is like a shortest path problem given this grid, and uh, you have the two uh, endpoints. You want to <clears throat> compute uh, the shortest path between them. And these uh, edges are cutted edges. So when neural network uh, learns uh, the shortest path, it will actually predict a lot of uh, weird case that the human uh, child will never uh, make. So at, when we uh, when we uh, find the shortest path, at least uh, our ch uh, children, when they uh, do this, they try to uh, make a connected edges. They don't actually randomly generate uh, things like that. So we have a constraint that uh, for the shortest path, it should be at least a path. That means yeah, for each of the intermediate nodes, there's only one incoming edge and one outgoing edge. Okay, it may not be the shortest, but at least people are trying to uh, satisfy their constraint. So what we wanted to do is to inject this constraint in the neural network learning and uh, of course, uh, we know that uh, this path constraint can be represented in a logic program or ASP program easily, okay? So these rules are saying that for each of the nodes, there should be only one incoming edge and only one outgoing edge. And then uh, this is to represent reachability condition and so on, okay? And using this um, uh, weak constraint, we can even express the shortest path, okay? So having uh, done that, uh, if we have the uh, uh, multi-layer perceptron uh, trained with the cross entropy, which is the baseline that uh, the uh, typical uh, loss function that you use, then uh, you get the uh, predictions uh, that satisfy path constraint in only uh, this percentage. Okay, and the, so basically this one uh, can find shortest path uh, with only 23% uh, and uh, only 28% uh, satisfy the path constraint. <clears throat> but if you uh, use the neural uh, neuras, uh, and here you can uh, train with this uh, path constraint, you only use uh, this rule. Um, the accuracy of finding the shortest path increases. Um, so it's not really 100% because uh, multi-layer perception is not really great to find the path. Uh, however, at least 96% of the prediction satisfy the path constraint. So you you told uh, the neural network when you find the short uh, path, uh, shortest path, um, try to satisfy this constraint. That's what we uh, gave uh, when when we trained the NLP with this neural rule and find out that this is the case. In the, indeed, uh, the prediction may not be correct, 
to find the shortest path, but at least 96% uh, uh, satisfy the path constraint. And, um, and we can actually give the uh, whole program as the, uh, in the training, and then uh, we can actually uh, make the accuracy to be uh, uh, more uh, higher, and also we can uh, make path constraint to be 100% true. Okay, <clears throat> and these are the other examples uh, of weak supervision. Um, so here, uh, the examples are like the addition problem. You're given the uh, sum of the rows here, but you don't give the labels of these digits. And here, uh, we give the numbers and we give the, uh, we don't, we, we, this is the image of the uh, operator and try to classify the operator. And if you do that, uh, I mean, this is actually other, uh, uh, the table that compares to other implementation and you have to, uh, that's do well sometimes and sometimes not. Okay, um, all right, so I think I covered uh, all of uh, the stuff. Uh, just uh, if you're interested in, there are some publication lists here. Uh, I didn't introduce some of the uh, things. There are some uh, theorems about uh, LTM and called splitting theorem, and uh, some, uh, somebody also at a parallel LTM and solver. Uh, and uh, I skipped this uh, thing, but they are also related uh, uh, relation to the other uh, formalism like uh, p -log. Um And there is some uh, application of LTM for hybrid classification with contextual knowledge. <clears throat> and there are uh, something called action languages, which is high level representation of the um, uh, uh, action domain. So, um, so that, that is actually, so ASD language is a bit uh, hard to understand, but the action languages are more natural language style so that uh, people can write the action description easily. And there's also decision theoretic version and form DP representation um, and so on. And uh, this is actually uh, not uh, my group's work, but um, uh, the people who uh, uh, develop Klingo, they actually have P-Lingo, um, which uh, is, uh, I think is doing something similar to the LPMLN, but probably they did more optimization uh, and maybe that could be uh, faster than LPMLN solver. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you for listening. And thank you, for, uh, sorry for my voice. <laughs> I thought my loss was in the middle. Thanks, thanks. Very, very.